Spinal care has changed. This program will look at the changes for EMS providers and how they impact our patient care. Research in evidence-based medicine has determined that changes in spinal care need to be implemented. A 2013 joint position statement from the National Association of EMS Physicians and the American College of Surgeons states, the benefits of long backboards is largely unproven. The long backboard can induce pain, patient agitation, and respiratory compromise. Further, the backboard can decrease perfusion and pressure points, leading to pressure ulcers. Let's look at a list of potential complications from backboarding. This is a flow chart of Pennsylvania's guideline for spinal care. It has been in the guidelines since 2013 and now is enforced. If you are not from Pennsylvania, please refer to the guidelines from your area. Emergency departments and trauma centers in the Commonwealth have been notified of the changes in EMS spinal care and providers should not encounter difficulties. Pre-hospital spinal care will continue to be assessment-based and will focus, when indicated, on restricting spinal motion instead of the prior philosophy of spinal immobilization. Good assessment skills are still necessary to identify patients who do need restriction of spinal motion. Initial patient contact focuses on assessment for signs of blunt trauma or mechanism of injury. After the provider's assessment, there are five clinical criteria used to determine if a patient requires restriction of spinal motion, spine pain, tenderness, or anatomical deformity, altered mental status, signs of intoxication with alcohol or drugs, patient distracted by a painful injury, and neurodeficit after trauma. Once it has been determined that restriction of spinal motion is necessary, a rigid cervical collar will be applied. If the patient is ambulatory, allow the patient to move to a stretcher with minimal spinal motion into a seated position, then lay back gently. If the patient is non-ambulatory, use a backboard or scoop stretcher to move the patient to the stretcher with minimal motion. They may be removed from the device once they are placed on the stretcher. A cervical immobilization device, CID, may also be used to restrict lateral neck rotation. In certain situations, a long backward will still be used as an extrication device, but plays no significant role in restricting spinal motion. If a backboard is utilized during extrication, the EMS crew may, at its discretion, remove the board prior to initiating transport. The scoop stretcher has played a secondary role in moving patients for many years and now can be a primary method of moving a patient requiring restriction of spinal motion. It can be used to move a patient to a stretcher and then remove to allow for patient comfort during transport. Contraindications to restriction of spinal motion include no history or mechanism of injury consistent with spinal injury, penetrating trauma of the chest, abdomen, head, neck, or back, gunshot wounds to the head, and non-traumatic back or neck pain. You should not struggle or force an uncooperative, combative patient to restrict spinal movement. Transport the patient and be sure to document the encounter. To summarize, utilize the philosophy of restriction of spinal motion instead of spinal immobilization. Perform a thorough assessment looking for signs of blunt trauma and mechanism of injury. Know the five clinical criteria for restricting spinal motion. And finally, practice and use the methods of restricting spinal motion.